Tories were once described, it's one of my favourite sayings, as mental Velcro. Isn't that nice? Mental Velcro. They stick. And if you don't remember anything from today, you'll probably remember one or two stories, not necessarily that I've told you, but have come from somewhere else or maybe fellow delegates. They bury in the brain and they stick. And because they stick, it's easier for people to spread a good story that you've maybe told about yourselves because they can remember it. Okay? And the better the story, the easier it is for them to forward it on. And all the social marketing experts will tell you that the power of storytelling is not necessarily what you say about yourself, it's what other people are saying about you, but putting those stories out there sows the seeds that allow people to talk about you. Seth Godin uh, was mentioned before. I thought, was I the only person that put his hand up that, that knew of him? The man, oh, thank goodness. The man is a genius, marketing guru based in New York, and he wrote a book called The Purple Cow. If you're in a field full of cows and you're a cow that's black and white, good luck, you'll not get noticed. But if you're purple, then you will stand out. So the, the thrust of the purple cow is the importance of being remarkable. And remarkable is a really good word because it means worth talking about. So ask yourself this hard question. Are the things that we're putting out there, our marketing message, are we putting things out there that are worth people talking about? And in many cases, the answer is no. There are a wonderful example of show versus tell. And let me give you an example of this. John Lewis, the John Lewis Partnership, a very successful retailer in the UK, um, may say that they're really good at customer service. But I think it's better to show it. I have a friend who works for John Lewis. And I asked her once, what's the most memorable piece of customer service you can remember in all your time working for the company? And she said, without a doubt, it was when I worked in the kitchen department and um, a doctor and his wife had been prowling around my department for weeks and hadn't bought a damn thing. And I was getting frustrated. But this one day, Saturday, was decision day. They decided to do the deed and to buy a kitchen worth 25,000 pounds. Top of the range, so she was understandably very thrilled. So she sat down with them for about an hour, going through all the specs, the layouts, the color schemes, where do you want things positioned, all that kind of thing, delivery times. And she was just about to close the deal. The pen was poised, about to sign on the line that is dotted. And he said, I don't think we can go ahead. And she said, why? He said, well, I don't think you'll be able to deliver it to us. And she said, why not? He said, well, our, our house is notoriously difficult for delivery vans to get to. It's a nightmare. So she didn't want to be outdone, so she dispatched a reconnaissance team to go and look at it. And sure enough, it was awful. Narrow little lane, trees tight up to one side of the house, body of water up to the other side, total nightmare. Do you know what she did? She hired a barge. She parked it under a bridge. They lowered the kitchen units one by one onto the boat, and she sailed the kitchen to the doctor's house. And when she got back to John Lewis, they said, you can't do that. Health and safety, oh. And she said, well, I've done it. And it's gone down in John Lewis folklore as one of the greatest pieces of customer service they've ever heard of. Now, the power of that story, I think, is that John Lewis can claim to be good at something, but that's their opinion themselves. It's much better to allow a story to do the work for you. And therefore, you allow the audience, the listener, to make their own mind up about you. And therefore, it's more trusted. Stories also engage emotionally. I've put a picture of the brain there. For those neuroscientists amongst you, you'll find it overly simplistic. There may be none. Most of us, particularly in the professional services community, are used to appealing to the intellectual parts of the brain. We present a rational argument, and we're surprised when somebody doesn't accept it, or maybe they buy from somebody else. And this happened to a client of ours recently, and he asked the client, why did you choose the other presentation? And the client said, well, theirs felt better. And he was an accountant, and he didn't understand that. 
right side of the brain needs to be engaged. So stories are a wonderful way of generating an emotional connection with what's being talked about. They also help us to understand. We all have within us, within our brains, a kind of um, uh, a series of story templates. We fit things that we hear about into templates. And you hear an experience that someone relates. And you kind of think, oh, yeah, I know what you mean by that. So you've immediately, automatically, subconsciously fit what you've heard into a structure that's already there. So they enable us to understand things very, very quickly. And um, I loved, um, Itzy, did you play that piece uh, from um, The Pursuit of Happiness, the Will Smith film? Yeah? Anybody seen that film? It's, um, it's an example of one of the, some would say, five story types. It's a rags to riches story, isn't it? Because he was down on his luck, and at the end of the movie, he was doing really, really well. That's the story. And we love stories of transformation. So if you can explain in your marketing <laughs> stories how you've transformed someone's for fortunes, and they've, you've left them much better off at the end than they were at the beginning, that's a kind of story template that screenwriters and directors have been using for years to emotionally engage their audience. Another one would be the quest. Give me an example of a, a quest movie. We're in BAFTA, come on. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, thank you. Classic quest movie. So let me ask you this question. In the way that you communicate what you do, could you be on some kind of mission or quest of your own? Could you identify um, perhaps an injustice that's out there? that you're fighting to fix? Could it be that clients are not fulfilling the potential of their businesses and you know that you can fix that for them and you're passionately committed to doing it? So what I'm saying here is that if you can try, if you can communicate in a way that tells some kind of story, there's a narrative template to it, it really helps your audience understand it, get it and warm to what you're saying. just clarify what I meant by story. I said I'd define it, and I want to define it in ways which will make sense to you as business people. I've already mentioned before that you might be on a quest. That's a great big picture story to tell. This is what we're about as an organization. This is what we believe in. This is the mission that we're on. Fantastic, particularly if you live it out. When you communicate in that way, the people who have that problem will see you as heroic. And they'll see you as heroic because you're fighting their corner, you're on their side. And isn't it wonderful to be seen as a hero rather than just a provider of a product or a service? The second type of story would be, let's say, an elevator pitch. Has anybody heard of the phrase, the, uh, the elevator pitch? The so-called 30, 60 second summary in answer to what do you do? I'm a ghost hunter. Doesn't always work very well. Um, I think the problem with the elevator pitch is just that. It, people default to that factual description. And when you do that, you can be lost. You can be misheard or not heard at all. So what I think you need to do is you need to say something which intrigues people. You need to say something which makes them want to know more. They pull more information from you. So if they say to you, oh, that's really interesting, could you tell me how you do that? Then you've won. You've got the conversation to flow. There's also a lovely little structure. If you're ever thinking about how do I describe what I do in very, very simple terms, use PAL. P-A-L. P stands for pain, A stands for aspirin, L stands for legacy. We're all very, very good at describing the aspirin because that's what we do, isn't it? It's the work we do every day, and we'll talk forever and a day about that. We're less good, and this should appeal to the accountants in the room, at doing the P and the L. That was my joke, by the way. <laughs> the only joke in the whole thing. <laughs> We're not very good at describing the pain. And the pain is actually about the client. It's actually about not us, it's about them. And the, and the audience is always more interested in themselves than they are in you. So if you can tap into their pain, if you can describe a scenario which they can identify with, they will be on your wavelength and they'll be really, really interested in what you do about it. 
But similarly, you've got to do the L. And the L is the legacy. It's the happy ending, again, back to this narrative. It's the way you've left clients in a better place than they were at the beginning. And this conference has the word dream in it. And a dream, in many respects, could be part of this L, this legacy description. Because if you can describe to people where they could be, having worked with you, that sounds an awful lot better than where they are now, you're describing what could be the, the aspirational future. And they'll think, oh, yes, that sounds better than where I am now. How do you take me there? And that's one. OK, that's a success. So think of PAL as a basic structure. And the third type of story is your classic kind of uh, anecdotal vault. Everybody in this room has a personal library of experiences, don't you? Things that have happened to you, things you've seen, things that you've lodged in there. There's a library. But not all of you will recognize that there's a library. And not all of you will be able to find things in that library when you need to. And really, really good communicators and people who will deliver a message in a compelling way and build rapport very, very quickly with people are very good at naturally and, and, and spontaneously pulling something out of their mental library and delivering it in the moment. And it's how we get on with people. It's how we build or find common ground. So if somebody says, did any of you have a nightmare journey recently? Maybe this morning, hopefully not tonight. And if you share that with somebody, they'll probably say, oh, yeah, you know, I had the same thing a couple of weeks ago. So you've naturally pulled out something from that locker anyway. So we're all doing it all the time. But what I'm saying is that if you can systematize that and make it more um, a little bit slicker in the moment and have different versions, you were saying it's a, sometimes it's a short version, five minutes, sometimes it's 10, 15, 20, an hour, whatever, then it's a fantastic social skill and will allow you to connect with the people you're looking to, to influence.